Hey everyone, thanks for watching. After a two week hiatus to enjoy Christmas and New Year's, we are back with Anna Kelly uh, and her weekly show. How you doing, Anna? I'm doing great. Happy New Year, Michael. Happy New Year, Merry Christmas, all that great stuff. I gotta tell you, I, lo I look forward to talking to you, uh, but having two weeks off with the family is, is totally okay, I get it. Yes. Yes. It was nice to catch up and, you know, I, I think there's something to be said about really taking some time to enjoy um, the holidays and not always feeling like you have to be on and 10x and, you know, you want to plan, but you've got to have time to just stop and enjoy life. And so I really just enjoyed being home and playing games and now I'm, I'm back in the swing of things and rare enough and excited to, to do great things for this year. <laughs> so were you, were you a mom for two weeks and not REI mom for two weeks? For most of two weeks, I was just mom. <laughs> There's awesome. always some REI stuff, but, uh, but I really, try to minimize that yeah. last two weeks. Yeah. <laughs> Good for you. Good for you. Well, hey, I had a topic that I wanted to bring up with you today. Literally in the last 60 minutes, I got a question from a subscriber to this channel. And I want to set it up, and then you and I can bat it around. So um, this individual was 60. Uh, they live in the Midwest. They own their house free and clear. Uh, they have no real retirement savings, which I took to mean no 401k, no pension. Mm -hmm. um, but their question was, basically the question was, is it too late for me to get started? And if I were, what should I do? So mm -hmm. I thought we'd bat that around today, knew, knowing that I was going to talk with you. So what are sure. your first thoughts? Somebody comes up to you, they're 60, their house is free and clear, kids are out and gone on their own, but now you're at 60, you know, no retirement you know, you're thinking real estate investing. What, what do you think? What do you do? I think there's a couple of things, Michael. You know, one of the, if you don't have retirement accounts and you're retired and you got a house free and clear, my first question was, would be, do they really have enough to live on with whatever's coming in from retirement? So if their living expenses are, are covered, you know, they're, they're in better shape to even consider something like tapping home equity to invest. But being 60, I'd say they have to be much less aggressive and much more risk averse, especially in this market, getting started with no experience. So while I believe in tapping home equity where it makes sense and using that to invest where you can make a good difference on the spread. So what I mean by that is, let's say I could get a home equity loan for four, I can, you know, invest and make three or 4% on that. You know, I could be a private lender and make eight to 10% and I'd, I'd have a small return mm -hmm. or I could take that money and buy a, a cash flowing rental property that will bring me in some rental income. That can be a fairly conservative thing to do with some of your home equity where because you're getting cash flow from that investment every month, mm -hmm. you're not really putting too much at risk. You just got to be really careful with what you buy. If, if you tap the equity. Yeah. So let's, let's break that down a little bit because I do see two angles, right? So again, I haven't spoken literally emails, right? Like, I don't know, hundred words or less is what we all have to drive on, but let's try to peel it apart. So one thing you could absolutely do, because that seems like they have an asset, let's just say it's worth 300 grand. It, it, they didn't say what it was worth, but let's just say it's worth 300 grand. Um, you know, they could theoretically get a home equity line for 50% of that very conservatively, right? 150 grand. Um, you know, you really could do one of two things, right? You could be that private lender and make a spread of seven to eight points, right? Or, or you could buy a, you know, a single family home in their neighborhood. Again, we don't know what that is, but again, with 50% down, you probably buy one or two, uh, maybe get three to 600 cash flow because it's a pretty conservative loan. Does one strike you as more interesting than the other kind of being a private lender versus, you know, being a first time landlord? Any thoughts? Yes. First of all, exactly the same number, that 50% number of equity is exactly what went through my head. I thought, you know, if they've got 300K, you don't want to leverage all of that to start investing because you, there is beauty to having a, a paid off home as a retired person who's not looking to use equity constantly to turn and burn and, and yeah. make more cash flow. So I think, you know, if you borrowed against 50% of it, you still got some good equity in that house. And it's plenty. If you had 300,000, 150,000 is plenty to buy a couple of rental properties. So mm -hmm. what I would like better than a single family house would be able to see them buy a small multi-unit, ah, like yeah. a 
duplex a fourplex because you can buy, you know, depending again where their rental market is and whether they're comfortable with buying something from mm -hmm. afar, you know, if you could buy a four unit apartment building for 250,000, you'd need 50,000 down. Yep. So if they had 150,000, just for numbers sake, mm -hmm. they might be able to buy three, four unit apartment buildings and bring in at least $3,000 a month on that, maybe $4,000 a month. Mm -hmm. So that would be a pretty nice chunk of cash you know, their mortgage payment at 4% on 150,000 is going to be a couple hundred. Yeah. So it could really create a substantial cash flow for them to supplement their retirement income and, and be a fairly safe bet um, for a way to get started investing where they don't have to know a whole lot about real estate. Mm -hmm. As long as they kind of study a market, they work with a realtor who really understands, you know, that market and some small multis and they really understand what the rental income could be and what the values are you know, go with the realtor, don't overpay for properties, and don't buy anything at 60 years old unless you really want to get out there and start, you know, doing handiwork. Yeah. You're probably going to cost yourself more money trying to do it yourself. Just plan to, you know, hire a property manager, pay them five to 6%, um, ha buy a property that's basically turnkey, mm -hmm. which you and I both mean it doesn't need a lot of work. Yep. And you can pay retail, and still cash flow a couple thousand dollars a month using home equity um, and having it managed by a property manager. So as a 60 year old, they're not going to want to put a ton of time in it, not going to want to put a ton of, of sweat equity. I, I just buy a turnkey, a few turnkey rentals and yeah. let the checks come in. Yeah. I think there's a, a couple of things I, I agree 100%. First, just a little twist on what you said. Not that you said this, but just that's how the math worked out. Is I wouldn't use all 150 on three different fourplexes, right? I'd probably do two, and then keep that other 50k, that powder dry, just for at least at least for the first year, because you just never know as a first time landlord, right? You don't want to have a roof leak or just something out of nowhere blow you up and hit become yeah. a forced seller. Um, other than that, absolutely. Go for turnkey. Don't do value add. At 60, a first-time landlord, you don't want to go into something that's 30% undervalued, multiple vacancies, and needs a capital investment of $25,000. Because after you're said and done, it'll be $40,000. Um, right. Not the, not the place to and play. And that's really smart. Keeping some of it out for, for unexpected and for slush and, and for cash flow is wise. Yeah. Uh, other than that, I think that's that's perfect advice. And And Again, yeah, you're right. The, let's talk about study your market. I call it learn your market. Um, mm -hmm. I want to put a time frame on that because some people just go, hey, I looked at it for a week and I'm done. Oh my <laughs> God, what are you thinking? So they're sitting across, it's Starbucks or whatever local coffee shop is next to you. This person is there and you tell them to learn your market and they go, how long? I mean, wh when somebody asks you that question, how long do you tell them before they should write their first offer? You know, I, I think if it's in your backyard where you can drive properties within how, half an hour and you can go see properties every day mm -hmm. and you can go look at other apartment buildings for rent or other houses or four units for rent and you can really spend, you know, a couple hours a day um, looking at Trulia and Zillow and Craigslist to see what are properties that are multi-unit selling for mm -hmm. and what are they renting for. And even if you're buying single family rentals, it's the same concept. So you mm -hmm. want to be able to, to spend a couple of months really not only just pulling them up online, but driving by the properties and see the kind of condition they're in. Because if I walk a hundred properties in a month or two, at least drive by them and yep. see what they're worth online, see what they're not only being listed for, but how fast they sell. And then... Um, you can look up like on realtor.com or whatever your local MLS website is, you can go look at sold listings. So mm -hmm. you can say, Hey, this four unit sold for 250 and this one sold for 230 and this one sold for 260. Yep. If you can kind of get a feel that, you know, four units in this market typically sell between 225 and 280, then you know that that's ballpark what you should be looking to mm -hmm. pay for something. Yep. And what I did when I got started, Michael, and this is what I tell my coaching clients, is I say, I want you to create two spreadsheets. One of them is properties for sale, and one of them is properties for rent. And what I do is I create a spreadsheet in my target market, just the town that I want to invest in. Or if you're rural, maybe you pick two small little towns. Mm -hmm. And you say, number of bedrooms, number of bath, square mm -hmm. footage, 
and what kind of condition is the exterior and the condition of the interior either is bad, poor, fair, good, or totally renovated. And then I put in there, does it have a dishwasher? Does it have washer dryer connections? Does it have a yard? Does it have parking? Because if I have that basic information, and there's more things, you can make the spreadsheet how big, but if you have those basic information about what people are looking for to rent a property, mm -hmm. and I know not only what are they selling for, but what are they renting for and people actually getting for rents, mm -hmm. then I can have a pretty good idea within about two to three months, what should I pay for a property in this market and what is it going to rent for today? And I created a spreadsheet and for a year, I looked every single month on MLS for what was selling. Yeah. And every single week I went on Zillow and Craigslist and I looked at rents and I wrote them down in a spreadsheet with the property address, the seller's phone number. And then I used that later, the seller's phone number to call sellers who were renting to say, Hey, I saw you rented property. Are you interested in selling? Ah. So yeah. that's what I would do is I would just, I'd go to the internet on all of my free time study the market and then contact some realtors to ask their opinion and get them to show you actual properties that are listed. Uh, it's so amazing how our stories are, are so similar. Cause again, we don't practice these. We don't prep these. Uh, so I tell people, yeah, 60 to 90 days. I looked every day for 10 years. Uh, and again, the whole idea is the same, right? P for me it was cause that's a, I'm in a, I'm in a big Metro, like almost a million people. So I picked a zip code and an asset type, right? The asset type was three bedroom, two bath. That's, Yes. I lived in. It's what I knew. That's all I looked at for probably the first four years of my investing. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what I tell students today is, you know, if you're, if you're only going to give me a week of looking at the market, don't bother. It, you know, it just don't, you've got to look yeah. every day for 60 to 90 days, figure out what's moving, what's not. Cause when you're done, you need to have confidence in what a good, great average or bad deal is. That's all I'm Absolutely. trying to say. Because if you only yes. swing at good and great deals, you know, you don't need to do very many. Right, right. Uh, so that's very cool. So I like this. Okay. And the other thing that you said about zip codes that, that is really powerful, if you mm -hmm. can kind of hone in on, you know, this is a zip code that I'm really interested in, and maybe you pick one or two or three, mm -hmm. then you're only focusing your time there. Because if I go, yeah. I'm going to look at all of Los Angeles or yeah. all of Houston, Texas or all Philadelphia. You can look at so many properties, you'll run yourself ragged, you'll spend lots of days and you'll see oh, yeah. so much variance, you'll still have no idea. Yeah, you won't so learn a thing. On, yeah. yeah, and one of the things that I like to do too, um, if I'm going into a new market, and I did this in, in my little area as well, is I go on and I look at sales and I yes. look for the average sale volume. So whatever average price range has the most sales, it's typically you're going to want to rent in a first time home buyer price range or below because those are the people that are going to rent. So if you start saying, I'm going to look at properties that are, you know, anywhere from a hundred thousand to 300,000, you're not going to make much as a rental in, in areas where the first time home buyer range is like 15, you know, 150,000. Yes. Your max rent you're going to be able to get in that area might be 13 or 14 or 1500 yeah. because anything above that people can afford to buy. So exactly. And so when you're looking for rental property, I yeah. want to say, what is the average sale house price of a first time home buyer? Cause they're usually that sales price is what's going to sell 70% in most zip codes, unless it's really high end. Yeah. And I say, okay, if they're $150,000 post first time home buyer, I want rental properties that are going to sell between a hundred and 150,000. Then you can really hone in on this is the, the type of properties I'm looking for and I want to go through. And then you can let all the other asset types go to your point about really getting clear on that asset type. Yeah. You got to get focused, right? I love your example of LA. I mean, somebody came to me and said, I want to go look at everything in LA. I don't care if you did it for a year, you wouldn't learn anything. There's so much variability yeah. and, all of that. And then, yeah, okay. Awesome. So, okay. So that's essentially, good news is that's essentially what I told him in my first email response. Then he freaked me out. He comes back with, do you think I should be aggressive? Is now the time to be aggressive? I'm like, oh, ouch. So, okay. So you're at Starbucks, Anna, you go through all of that. They're now sitting with you. It's like, okay, is it time for me to be aggressive? How do you respond to that question? So th I, this is what I say. Every person is at a different place in terms of how much risk they're willing to take on. 
Yeah. However, when contemplating the risk that you should be willing to take on, you have to factor in one, your age, two, your other sources of income, mm -hmm. and three, how much cash you have available to mess up with. Yes. Because if you take risk, you will lose money at some point. It's just a matter of when, not mm -hmm. if. Absolutely. The third thing is what is the market giving you? Are you at the top of the market? Are you at the bottom of the market? Are you in the middle of the market? Yeah. Where we are today, and I can't believe it's January 2020, I think we're at a height of a market cycle. And most people don't understand market cycles, as we talked about before. So prices are pretty high now and probably due for a correction or a downturn. Mm -hmm. That will also, not only will it make prices potentially come back down a little bit over the next couple of years, but also rents could come down if we hit a recession. Mm -hmm. And so if I go in and I buy something that is risky, um, meaning I overpay, that could be risk, mm -hmm. or I overestimate my rents, that could be risk, or I just don't know what I'm doing and I underestimate repairs that I'm going to have to make. There's all kinds of things you can do that are risky. Mm -hmm. You're going to have some fallout if you're not really careful. And so the fact that they're 60 years old, they don't have any other retirement funds, and they're using home equity to make this purchase, they should be one of the most risk-averse categories of investors right now yeah. and should not take risk. And one of the things that you asked me to kind of circle back to about rental properties versus being a private lender, mm -hmm. flipping right now, in my humble opinion, and there are some who disagree with me, flipping right now is not the ideal game to get started in. And if Absolutely. you're 60 and you're trying to start flipping, it's not great. So if there's a lot of people trying to get into flipping right now when prices are high and when it's tough to sell and make as high of a profit because of building costs, because of competitors' marketing costs and what they can sell them for and comps, then flippers are going to have trouble meeting their debt service. Yes. So I don't want to be the private lender lending to the flippers who are flipping at a time in the economy that might not be great. If yeah. you're lending to somebody that you know has a ton of experience, they've got a great operation and a really good track record, then maybe you can take some of that cat, that home equity and lend to them. Mm -hmm. But home equity is equity that I think is kind of more sacred than your equity in your rental properties. Oh, for sure. Because you do need that safety when you're retired. And so I feel like it's more risky for someone in their position with no other nest egg in retirement yeah. to be a private lender than it is for them to just buy a safe turnkey rental at the right price point in the right area today. Yeah, I think there's so much there I agree with. Everything I everything right there I agree with. First and foremost, <laughs> flipping today. So if you're flipping uh, owner-occupant 2x the median, whatever your median is across the country, you're going to very likely lose money in the next 12 to 18 months. Inventory mm -hmm. is growing up. I mean, I just did a video this morning about Manhattan, which I've always looked at as the, pe the tip of the tip of the spear. They were down 7.5% just in Q4, right? That's wow. occupant values down. Mm -hmm. How many people could suffer a 7.5% drop in their ARV? most flippers go bust. And I've seen right. it before, right? I was investing back in 06, 07, 08, 09. I knew people that lost multiple properties because the market turned and they were short. And once one domino went, they all fell. So right. yeah, I would not be lending a dollar on anybody who flips 2X the median. I don't care what city you're in. Um, right. So I agree with that entirely. Second, again, you're so right. We are at the top of the market. Could it go higher? Sure. Is it likely? I don't think it's likely, but it could, right? So this is the time to learn. And if you are going to make an investment, you're absolutely right. It is a turnkey, small multifamily. So you get residential, which you and I both know is four units and below. Mm -hmm. I would prefer something closer if that's an option. They're in the Midwest. I don't know where in the Midwest, um, but probably means they have something they could drive to so they could learn. And I would only do one. I would do one. But I wouldn't do one until like April or May because we already said you got 90 days to learn. So, yeah. you know, so that, I mean, it's, it, it, I literally looked at my phone when I was walking my dog going, did he just say that? Is, is now the time to be risk, you know, to go all in or whatever? I'm like, oh my God, no. Sacred yeah. capital, you can't get it back. You're putting at risk the only thing you have left, right? Which is your, your home, again, based on one email or two emails. So 
yeah, it's, I've always believed in anything I've done is you've got to protect the downside first. And there's just too much downside to say, go all in, be aggressive today, in my opinion. It's yes. probably the worst time in 20 years to, to go all in it's right. sick, with no experience. Right. Oh. And, and in general, you know, I, I think we've talked about this before. I mean, in, in the different phases of your life, there's a certain age of your life where cash flow is like, you're really trying to accumulate. So mm -hmm. you're in this accumulation mode, this yeah. growth mode. Yep. And then you get to a place where you're in this um, preservation mode. And then, and you, and you need cash flow. And so at 60 with home equity and not much else retirement, preserving the money that you have should be the most important part of that, in, that, that investment trifecta. Yeah, you're absolutely. kind of past the big accumulation phase mm -hmm. and you're in that preservation phase where you want some cash flow to help with your, your living through retirement. And so a rental property in a, in a good area with good, strong school districts, like we've talked about before you know, that's something that's going to be a rental property that's going to have a fairly stable asset in a market where there are not huge ups and downs like California and yeah. Florida and New York and New Jersey. You want an area like where I am in Hershey, Pennsylvania, our values have not gone up or down significantly since 07. So we had a lot of stability here where a lot of the rest of the country, it was huge swings. Mm -hmm. So you find one of those markets that's really stable with really strong schools and buy a rental property or two, just collect the cash flow. Don't get aggressive. You mm -hmm. know, don't pay a, a little um, too much to get, you know, a tiny bit difference in, in cash flow. Just buy your nice vanilla property and a property that you can sell quickly if you have to. Exactly. So that's another thing to think about. So when you, when you look at properties, and this is where talking to a realtor or a mentor can really help you, mm -hmm. you know, for this particular person that doesn't know, when I first got started, I saw all these properties for sale that nobody bid on. And I thought, Oh, I can, I can buy this and I can turn it into a great rental. And a lot of the properties had functional obsolescence. Yes. So they might claim that it's a three bedroom, but you have to walk like through one bedroom to get to the other <laughs> or through a bathroom to get to the other bedroom. And oh, yeah. so those kind of things, it's, it's attractive to say, Oh, I'm going to buy this property, but then it's hard to rent them. Yeah. And then it's hard to sell them if you need to sell. So you want to buy something. If you're buying singles, again, buying that first time home buyer, house price range, because then if you got to get out, you can either rent yeah. it to someone, sell it or sell it on owner financing and create yourself a note. So, yeah. you know, buying something that where you've got multiple exit strategies in case something happens in the economy that you don't expect so that you can get that cash back, I think is really important for someone that's 60 that's using home equity to invest. I love that thinking about the sale as well, because you just never know, right? Health, health scares happen right? Unfortunately in our lives. And you just, I, I think that's a great advice, right? Mm -hmm. Buying something that has the, the best chance to sell if you have to. And I have, you know, we all hope yeah. it doesn't happen and all of that, but I think that's, yeah. that's great advice. So this and that's been, something I do on everything I buy. So I think no matter what market cycle you're in, no matter where you are, no matter your age, you always have to think about multiple exit strategies before you purchase the property. But especially at this point in the market cycle, especially if you're older and if you don't have a lot of money to play with. Absolutely. So, hey, folks, if you're still watching this and you like these conversations between Anna and I, do us both a favor. Give us a thumbs up. It really helps the YouTube algorithm. But most importantly, I'd love this conversation because it was a subscriber-based question. So if you have a question for Anna and I for the next week or the week after or any week going forward, leave a question in the comments. We will both take a look at it. And if we get multiple, we'll just pick one. And if they're great, we may pick two. So do us a favor, leave questions below. And uh, I just want to thank you very much, Anna, for another great day. Thanks so much. All right. Take care. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.